welcome to Short Form. Thanks for having me. I figured we'd start uh, with your social media. I spent a long time deep diving on your social media profiles before this conversation. Oof, tough. <laughs> no, it was great. And loved the succession references, loved the billionaire insider info. Yeah. And I'm curious to chat more about your social media strategy today and how you started posting on social media and what inspired you to start posting. Kind of by accident more than anything. You know, I, I did a TV show for 10 years called Million Dollar Listing New York on Bravo. Um, and I don't think anyone thought it was going to be as, as big as it ended up being. But for a TV show to last a decade, I think is, is a pretty good run. And what I saw from that was, you know, our, our format on that show was, you know, it follows three of us. And, you know, I was one of the, the agents and, you know, that's a listing there. So we would film me getting the listing, figuring out how to sell it. And then hopefully, hopefully, oh my God, hopefully it would sell. And that was it. And it would have to sell while filming it. And then the show would come out a year later. So it's, we would take 12 months to film a season from, you know, 12 to 14 episodes. And then the show would come out the next year. And while the show's coming out, we're typically then already filming the next season. But then people would email me and, you know, at early days, it was like tweet, you know, tweet at me or Facebook message um, asking about like, hey, I saw that condo. Did that actually sell? Because that's really cool. And if it's available, I'd love to come see it. It's like, well, but I have other things. And then I saw, I took a trip um, uh, to South Africa with my, my sister and her young kids who were like, I don't know, 10 and 13, something like that. And um, I don't spend a whole lot of time with younger kids like that age. And we got to the hotel that we were staying at in South Africa and there was no TV and Wi-Fi, but there was no TV. And I'm in my thirties. I'm like, what the hell am I supposed to do? There's no TV here at a hotel. This is insane. And the two kids could have cared less because they had their iPads, they had Wi-Fi. It's like, it like what, what TV shows do you guys watch? And they basically were like, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? What, do, what TV shows do you watch? I'm like, I don't watch TV. They've never, ever, maybe when they were little kids, they don't watch TV. They don't watch network television. They don't watch cable television. They barely even watch streaming. Their entire lives are in YouTube. And now YouTube and TikTok, mm -hmm. right? And so at that moment, I remember sending a message back to one of my team members. It was like, we need to get ahead of the decline in cable television that people have been talking about for a while, but like was there very much right in front of me. Mm -hmm. And let's take control of content and start creating it on our own. And so then I got a videographer and we started doing property tours and putting them out on Facebook and YouTube when people really weren't doing it. Um, and then Instagram got video, right? The video started coming through. Um, and then it was IGTV, which doesn't exist anymore and then everything else. And then just started pushing that out there. And I realized I could control my content to commerce, real estate brands that way. And I can move incredibly quickly. I can film something with you right now and put it on in 10 minutes. I don't have to wait a year. Right. And so that's kind of how it all started. And so are you using a content calendar and like premeditating what you will post or are you just kind of posting on the fly as the day unfolds? I used to post on the fly when I had a lot more time and I didn't think I had time back then, but man, oh man, I had more time. Uh, now I have a, now I have a content team with we have, we have an in-house production company. That's not just for me anymore. Now it's for all of our agents and our properties and our developers. And it's called Sirhan Studios and they're incredibly talented and they have their calendars and their things and their stuff and how they kind of process and, and look at my personal brand as I've made a concerted effort to pivot over the past couple of years from just, you know, real estate broker who does open houses and does appointments and that you might recognize from TV to really, you know, technology CEO. And as we start thinking about kind of like what that understanding looks like. And so your TikTok, that's also premeditated. Yeah. Everything I do is pretty premeditated. Sometimes, you know, here, like I post, there's one video on TikTok and it's always the spontaneous moments, but I was in uh, Florida and my daughter was like two, I guess. And like went to the bathtub, poured oh, all the that. bubbles in. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 
And everyone started freaking out. And I was like, oh my God, is she drowning? What's going on? Ran in there and I've never seen more bubbles in my life. And it was like in my parents, you know, they're older. And so they're like, what the hell is going on? And it's like this bubble mountain that just grew. And it grew up in like a, it grew in a perfect rectangle. And, you know, being the content creator that I am, instead of making sure anyone, everyone else is okay, I was like, camera up first. That was spontaneous. People like that one. It got like 15 million views. Yeah, it's insane. <laughs> Yeah. So insane. That's kind of stuff that you can't, I mean, that stuff is always going to happen though. Those are like, the way I look at social is kind of the way I look at, at selling, right? The same thing I tell all salespeople is you have to have a baseline salary. Like what is your baseline plan, right? And so for content, that's the same thing. Like what is your baseline content plan for the week, for the month, for the, the year? And then you're going to have bonuses. So like an investment banker, they have their base salary. And then if the bank does well, if they do well, they get a bonus at the end of the year. If they don't, they don't. So same thing here. We have a planned out content plan per platform that we action on every single day. And then bonuses will hopefully happen if we're in the right place at the right time. And you never know. I start to look at TikTok now more as a video diary than anything. I think that's where people have found it to be the most beneficial mm -hmm. and the most organic. Mm -hmm. um, it's incredibly addictive though. Yeah. It's like, it's, I, I, I can't, I can't even watch, sucked in. I can't watch a movie without also being on TikTok now. That's how I like figure yeah, out if a it's problem. a good show or not is whether I'm scrolling through TikTok or not. Exactly. <laughs> people talk about like the addiction to social and all that, but like I, I, the same conversations were had at the invention of color TV you know? Mm -hmm. And then it was like, do we put more, does, do, does the national household have more than one television? Is this bad for children or bad for the youth? You know, it was the same conversation was had with color magazines. You know? I mean, it's, it's, it's all something. I, I think TikTok's not nearly as addictive as once we start wearing social, right? Once we start wearing like the glasses and w once it's oh, embedded yeah. into our brains and neural links and all that stuff, that's going to be a problem. Terrifying. Yeah, I'll be scrolling through TikTok right now talking to you, <laughs> but my right eyeball is not, you know? <laughs> so scary. Is it though? I yeah, I don't know. But okay. So for people that are interested in posting content, most people don't because they're afraid of being judged, myself included. How did you overcome kind of the fear of what other people were thinking as you were on Million Dollar Listing New York and then began posting on social media? Million Dollar Listing was very public and I learned the, kind of the hard way. Like that first season, you know, it's kind of pushed along by the producers, you know, kind of we've, this is what the cast looks like. This is your role, you know? Um, and then the first season came out a million, you know, and millions and millions of people watched it. And then they put it all over the world. And it became very clear to me that maybe the things that I think are funny aren't really that funny to other people. <laughs> um, maybe me being funny actually comes across as mean. Maybe, maybe me being too busy actually comes across as being rude. And so all of a sudden you start watching yourself on an international screen at work all day long for then, you know, 14 episodes is 14 hours of television. And then the whole world gets to comment on how you work and how you talk and how you walk and how you act and how you go on dates and how you handle clients. And I mean, imagine if someone followed you around for a year at the office and in the shower and at the gym, you know, and here right now. And then the whole world got to comment on how you do podcasts. It like you, you, you really get into your head of like, oh, is that how I do those things? <laughs> I No, I'm a nice guy. I don't know what, I don't understand. Plus they use these like little moments, right? right. Nothing me doing a deal over my phone is not good TV. Mm -hmm. And so that would never be on, you know, television. It has to be like high stakes at mm -hmm. all times. Um, but I learned through MDL that like the more real and the more I let my guard down, the better it was for business. Like, I think like there's no need for you to post on social if you have no need for it. It's like anything we do, like, what's your, what's the end game? Like, do you want to write a book so you can sell and have it be a business and build up a fan club and build up a community around your stories? Then you should write books. If you're talented at it, you know, don't do it for free. Um, but if you don't, you're just doing it for like, I don't know, for yourself as like a hobby, then okay. But then you have to have different, a different understanding of what the end game might be. And so for me, social is about building personal brand following and awareness 
for selling real estate mm -hmm. and selling real estate and educational media services. That's why, that's why you do it. And that's mm -hmm. why you engage just like everybody. Good job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which I saw that you're selling, um, or you're posting quite a bit about this penthouse that's, yeah. um, asking for a quarter of a billion dollars. Yes. Yeah. 250. Yeah. Yes. Wild. One of the most expensive homes in the U.S. Yes. Yes. So what even goes into marketing something like that from a social media perspective and content perspective? Yeah. You know, most of the incredibly expensive homes we've sold have been relatively pretty quiet, you know, because it's it, anything over, let's say, $50 million as a home is kind of always for sale, right? At the right price. And so, you know, like we just, uh, kind of up the street actually right here, we just sold a place in Soho for 50, right? And no one will ever know about it. It's quiet, it's off market. And you know, that owner was a seller for like the last 10 years. But one day a buyer is available looking for something special with those specifications, goes in and there's a meeting of the minds and now it's time to sell. So, you know, there's, I could probably like hold in my two hands, the number of people that could afford a home for $250 million. And it's not just people who can afford it. It's people who could afford it. That would also want it. That would also spend that kind of money on a home that also want to be in New York city mm -hmm. that also want to be 1400 feet in the air yeah. that also have a need for having the highest private ballroom on planet earth. Like <laughs> there's, you know, 3000 billionaires in the world. You know, there's probably 300 people that could potentially want that out of 8 billion. So the marketing process is twofold. One, it's okay, those 300 people need to know about it. And who do they know? Because you never know. So that is a like guerrilla warfare, personal phone calls, personal emails, you know, getting to their people, their circle of trust kind of thing. And then you have, you know, billions of other people that you just never know who's going to know somebody. You know, we once sold a place for over a hundred million dollars through a video because it was, um, uh, someone from the middle East and their son saw the video and then showed it to dad. Mm -hmm. And that happens all the time. So when people come at me and they're like, oh, you you can't be a luxury salesperson and then be on TikTok and Instagram and all that. I'm like, I, I use the system against the system. Right. Like we, we market and we create entertaining real estate stories. I'm not looking for like the, the potential buyer to potentially watch. I mean, they might, mm -hmm. and they have, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm very much looking for the people in that person's circle of trust. Network effects. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. all network effects, right? It's affiliated marketing. If I can get the assistant, the business manager, the kids, the grandkids, the cousins, the mother, anybody in that person's circle of trust to be aware of this property. When you're looking for something expensive, you talk about it, you're, you're doing tours and now all of a sudden they're putting it in front of you. So for that penthouse, it's kind of the same thing. How many eyeballs can I get on it? Because I want to make sure that the world is aware. And then when that right person comes through the door, they'll have known about it. And I think we've done a pretty good job of making sure everyone's aware. Yes. Yeah. It's pretty spectacular. Yeah, um, it's, it's the most insane thing I've ever seen, which is also why we create so much content there. Like it's going to go viral if you just post yeah, that York, living room. You know, New York has cool spaces. Like, and I love New York because I love volume and there's, you know, there's 8,000 apartments on the market today. Um, you know, LA is fun. Miami's fun because the homes are different. You have the water, the beach mm -hmm. and everything, you know, the interiors can be so different. What if this house has an 80 foot TV that comes out of a pool and this house has a seal, blah, 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 blah. In New York, we're all sandwiched like sardines into these boxes. And like your apartment might have Carrera stone and they have Calcutta stone, but <laughs> like, there's only so much you can do in a box, you mm -hmm. know, and the houses start to really kind of look alike. And so to then go up to a penthouse like that and have a 30 foot ceiling and a 3000 square foot ballroom that's totally open at, you know, 1416 feet in the air with the highest private residential terrace of all, of all time, like on earth right there that you step out onto that is higher than sound and you can't even hear the street. What? Yeah. You're like, I have, to, I think we should make another video here. Like I don't, I don't have this here. And you know, we're selling an apartment right over there. It's $15 million and it's fine. It's okay. Yeah. Like, it's great. It's awesome. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, people are also, there's so much noise now. There's mm -hmm. so much content. There's so much stuff. So right. how do you grab that attention? You have to be able to find, you know, those unique moments. Mm -hmm. And for people, personal brand, like you are that unique moment. The more authentic you are, you are that version of that penthouse because you personally stand out from all the other people who are just trying to be like him or just trying to be like her. Mm -hmm. You know, if they embrace the weirdness. Right. Absolutely. And for those looking to reach high net worth individuals, is there a specific channel they should be focusing on? Or is it really just about volume and building the buzz in as many places as possible? I mean, there's services that you can use to pull people's emails and phone numbers and, yeah. and all that. But I mean, I, again, I very rarely have sold like cold by picking up the phone and calling someone with a net worth of over a billion dollars, right? That's hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, has happened, but it's hard. Um, more often than not, they have chiefs of staff right. who answer the gatekeepers, right? So chiefs of staff, you know, assistants, landscapers, plumbers, contractors, best friends, you know, a lot of them also have social media profiles that are private. And then you can see who they follow. So who do they follow that is public that you can start a relationship with? right? That you can follow, that you can find. Their interior designers have a lot of power, right? They're private bankers, they're attorneys. So in a city like New York City, there are a handful of major banks, major private equity companies, major, you know, family offices, um, you know, major law firms that handle, you know, these types of people that you can get in touch with to then have access directly to that client. And that's what you do. And then the major content is out there across the masses because you never know, like you'd be surprised, but you know, you'll make a property tour for a $1 million place. And the client that's going to buy it sends that video to all their friends and their family and say, hey, this is the, the listing video. This is what I'm buying. Someone who's spending $200 million is doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, they're sending that off to people like, hey, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. If you were a real estate broker now with $0 in your pocket, what would be the first thing that you would do? Here's what I would do. One, you have to get your license and you need a couple hundred dollars to do that. So if you have zero dollars, then you'd probably need to get a second job the way I had when I first when I first got here. So I would I would hand model. Oh. Yeah. If you Google Ryan Saran hand modeling, it is a it is a deep trip. Um so I would hand model. So what is that side hustle? It's good. Paid 150 bucks an hour. Okay. You don't have to pay taxes for a year, you know? And so it's all 1099 money. And so I would hold yeah. iPhones and, you know, Nespresso capsules and everything. And I have you know, big hands, I guess. And I've long fingers from piano. And so I can, you know, I can really hold things and all that. And so I became quite the parts model for a little bit. Um, I tried doing other modeling and I was just terrible, but it was the, the, the hand modeling would pay bills. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I could hold a phone for 10 hours and it be hung upside down, taking photos of my hands and they'd pay me 1500 bucks. And so my rent was a thousand dollars a month when I first moved to the city or 1100, sorry. 1100 and then as long as I can make $900 in addition to that, $2,000 a month, I could survive and I could stay in New York City and I wouldn't have to move home. And so once you've got your license and you figure out how to eat food and nice. you have a roof over your head, then the first thing you do is you go and interview to be on someone's team. Mm -hmm. You do not start in the real estate business completely by yourself. Um, uh, you have no idea what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? And there's you can also get in a lot of trouble if you tried it. You can. By all means, you can if you hang your license with a brokerage and they let you just do your own thing. But you should go and start on a team and be on that team for a minimum of two to three years, right? Like a graduate degree and just learn, just learn, help them with open houses, with appointments, with meetings, be in their emails, like understand how they're talking, do the trainings, really understand just because you can get a license in a week in the United States doesn't mean you should actually start working the next day. Right. right. Um, you know, it takes years to actually build up a Rolodex and to understand how to close, you know, how to show, how to build the systems, the process, the foundations. That's why we ended up eventually starting our, our cell like our hand programs and the courses. And how do you vet who to work for? You want to work for teams that are successful, that can actually have a need for you. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to go to a team that actually does no business because then you're just not going to have any guidance. You really want to work with somebody that's going to allow you to shadow them, to understand you know, and if they're a top, top team, they're not going to have any time to let you shadow them, but you're going to force them to make time. So you're going to be willing to do anything at any time, anywhere on any device. 
Like just be the person who's there doing all the signage in the mornings. Like you got to be willing to work for free Mm -hmm. in this business. So figure out a way to either save up money before you get into it or have a side hustle that is making you money on the side and then be willing to put in the hours and work for free and make yourself invaluable. And then if eventually you want to be the one who's doing the deals and be the role before you are the role, like show them that you are the person that can do this and they will just give you the work. Mm. Like it's what I do now, you know, agents that come here that work their ass off and really assume the role of a top producer before they ever even are. Those are the agents. I'm like, yeah, give that lead to her. Mm. Right. Or no, I see if he'll actually go do that because right. he's like busting his ass versus the other people who just complain. It's truly faking it until you make it in a certain sense. Yeah, I guess when I hear fake it till you make it, I think about like, I think about lying, mm-hmm. right? It's like showing up in a rented car, but saying I own it. Like that's that. Then you're then you're just lying. I like to think of it more as, um, uh, and I wrote about it in my 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 second book, Big Money Energy, about like really em- embracing and understanding future you. So like, who do you want to be in a year from now? And write that down. Like literally write it down. You're this is how much I weigh. This is what I'm wearing. This is where I live. This is how much money I have in my bank account. This is what I just sold. And start being that person today. Like mm-hmm. walk around with the confidence of future you today and assume that role. And you will you will be that person before that year is up. Like every time. It's amazing. Yeah. I love that. Um, manifestation. Yeah, always. Always. So you're a business owner, you're a creator, you're a podcast host, an author, a father. How how does one like take on so many roles. What is your secret? Is there a secret? You use people. Um, it's the best advice I ever got in like mm-hmm. 2010, I think, um, was if you want to build, you have to learn how to use people. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean that in like a bad way. Right. I mean, it in everyone has a path. So you dictate what your path is going to be, understand what your highest and best use is for yourself and for your time. We all have a thousand minutes every day to be productive, right? It's like 1,440 minutes in a day, 440 minutes of those are sleeping, eating, whatever. So we have a thousand minutes to be productive. How are you using those minutes wisely? And if you're doing stuff that other people could do for you, you should not be doing that stuff. And so like, even before I could ever afford it, I've always brought on other people to help me scale and help me grow to where I want to get to. And that's not the right advice for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't know how to manage people, if you don't want to manage people and you don't want to grow, then don't Mm -hmm. like just be happy by yourself. But if you do want to manage and you do want to grow, you know, we have, you know, we just passed a hundred employees here now. Um, and you know, that's a lot for me. <laughs> like we started the company two years, two and a half years ago, and there was one, you know, now there's a hundred people and, but they all enable me to just do what I'm best at, which mm-hmm. is sitting here with you. Oh, so that the company keeps moving. <laughs> Amazing. So I am curious to hear your thoughts on AI, since we are at our core, an AI company. And I feel like you might have some strong opinions on it. Yes. How are you thinking that AI will impact your work in the real estate sector? I think AI will impact everyone, obviously. And I like to think of it in the way, um, I think it was Warren Buffett who, who kind of put it into a nice little package where he said, um, you know, how many people get really excited about owning uh, refrigerant stock versus Coca-Cola stock, right? Coca-Cola has built an amazing company. Mm -hmm. Coca-Cola would not exist had there not been the invention of refrigerant, of refrigerators, Mm -hmm. right? That invention was huge. So AI is the refrigerator today. Mm -hmm. So what will people do with it? Like what is now the next Coca-Cola that can only now exist because refrigerators were invented? Video editing. Sure. Yeah. Video edit. I mean, edit literally everything, Mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, So for us, you know, we think about the real estate agent of who there are more and more and more that get into the business every single day. And so what does artificial agent intelligence look like? The same way I was just talking to you about learn to use other people. If you're a brand new agent, you're going to want to work at a firm where 
your highest and best use is just getting business and closing business. Everything else should be done by AI now, right? You should be able to just type in and say, hey, can you send a mailer to this address for these people and do this and do this without having to do what we've had to do for now for a long time, which is not to talk to this person, then I pick up the phone and call this person and then do this and do this and do this. You know, now it can be a much more automated process. I mean, imagine where we'll be in 10 years from today. On the moon, maybe. Maybe. Mars. Let's do it. Sell real estate on Mars. I think that'll be really, really hard. I am interested, though, in like the legal aspect of space exploration and like what business can now be created um, in space. You know, like my wife is a maritime attorney and maritime mm -hmm. law is she's Greek is used in space. Mm -hmm. That's what they use to dictate and govern, you know, the distance and the understanding and the ownership between satellites and this and that orbit and everything. And so, yeah, this like long forgotten, you know, legal field, or I guess not in Greece, mm -hmm. but you know, most people who go to, you know, Cornell law school don't go into maritime law. Right. I think you'll start to see that really, really switch around. So things like that interest me. Yeah. Do you see AI as like the biggest shift for real estate? Uh, the technology that will have the biggest impact on real estate? I think, I think virtual reality is still probably going to... Remember, real estate is incredibly visual. Mm -hmm. And so my ability to sell real estate to anyone, anywhere, on any device is what I care about the most. Mm -hmm. If AI can help us do that, then great. If it's metaverse technology and virtual reality that can enable us to sell that penthouse to someone in Singapore without them ever actually having to get on a plane or come here or get around any kind of COVID pandemic or they hurt their foot, you know, all the stuff that gets in the way of getting deals done, what that looks like, I think is super exciting to us as, as well. This was so much fun. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to me. Of course. Thanks for coming across the street. Thank you.